afternoon today. It's a great pleasure on behalf of the Japanese American National Library to present a community program um, as a part of our service in the community. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I wanted to start out by saying a few things, um, just kind of a few housekeeping things first. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Union Bank for allowing us to use their room in the hospitality room um, here in Japantown. They do that for us every time we have a program, so we appreciate that very much. And as you can see, the program is being videotaped and audio recorded today. So I wanted to let the audience know so that um, you'll know that anytime anybody also speaks, that will be recorded. So if you prefer not to be on the tape, please um, ask afterwards or something. Um, okay, and also I want to thank the uh, persons who helped us set up. A lot of you came in voluntarily and helped us um, get things started here. Thank you, and thank you for the videotaping and the audio recording and the PA system. Appreciate that very much. Okay, so as a starting point, I'd like to introduce Hiroshi Shimizu, who is the president of the Japanese American National Library, and he's going to present some greetings. Hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for attending on behalf of the uh, Japanese American National Library. Uh, Rita has put together a terrific uh, program, and uh, I'm sure you will enjoy it this afternoon, so thank you for coming. Okay, and now I'd like to introduce Carl Matsushita, who is the Executive Director of the Japanese American National Library, and has been the Director for many years, since 1968, right? Okay, so with that I'd like to introduce Carl Matsushita. Thank you for coming here today. Uh, just briefly talking about the library. The library has been celebrating our 46th anniversary. And in another four years, we'll be celebrating our 50th silver anniversary. So we'll be around for quite a while. Anyway, our libraries are basically uh, known uh, more for national and national level than local level. Uh, we get a support from the NHPRC of the National Archive and the NEA Bureau of Archive supporter for us. Uh, we hardly get anything from local level. <laughs> But anyway, the reason we're uh, well known is because we have a large collection related to publication, published material related to Japanese outside of Japan. It's not only Japanese and American Nazis, but we have a large collection of things related to Japanese and Canada, and now our, we are building up a uh, collection on Japanese and in South America and Southeast Asia and elsewhere. So anyway, we probably know we have our collection, including the National JSL Archive collection, which is most people know. And of course, we also have a whole bay and each bay and your entire collection from there as well. Anyway, if you have time, drop over in and see the collection, and I think you probably find something interesting. Right? Thank you very much. And one other board member who's here, I'd like to introduce Ben Kobashigawa. Ben, if you could stand. Ben has been, um, okay. Don't stand, Ben. <laughs> ben has been the past president for um, many years as well, so thank you very much. And there's a lot of volunteer work at the library, which is very much appreciated. Okay, with that, I'd like to uh, kind of give you a little overview about the program so you'll know, give you a heads up about what's to come. And so each speaker will be speaking for about 40 to 45 minutes. And I'm going to wait and introduce each one just before the presentation, so it's fresh in your mind who they are. And then following the first presentation, we'll go right into the second, and then at the end we'll have a little interaction, maybe among the panelists. And then we're going to open it up to everybody in the room so that anybody can ask questions or um, add any comments or present any reflection that they might want to contribute to the program. Okay, so with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and start the program. Um, I want to start by introducing Charles Wollenberg. Um, Charles Wollenberg has been an educator for many years, and you can see on the back of your program, that you probably picked up as you came in, um, on the back it gives a brief synopsis, but I want to say a little bit more. In case anybody did not get a program, could you raise your hand and maybe somebody could get it to you? Looks like everybody got it. Okay. So, um, 
Charles Womenberg has been a, a history instructor um, and a former social science chair at Berkeley City College, and he's been the convener of the California Studies Dinner Seminar at the University of California at Berkeley. And he's a scholar of the California Studies Center at the University of California, Berkeley, and has been a consultant at the Sacramento City and County Museum and Archives, has been very involved in archival and museum work, has been a consultant at the Oakland Museum, and also an oral historian, regional oral history office at the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley, and has been a history instructor at Laney College from um, 65 to 84, he has been a consultant at Clio Project at the University of California, Berkeley, and is a review editor for California History. So he has also been affiliated with um, and been on the steering committee at the California Studies Association. He's the current fellow and past board member of the California Historical Society, past president of Laney College Faculty Senate, the past president of Peralta, Peralta Federation of Teachers, and past member of the Berkeley City Human Relations Committee, and also a past delegate of the Alameda County Central Labor Council. Um, so as you can see, he's had a long, distinguished history of uh, work that has been a great contribution educationally for all of us, and we very much appreciate that. I also uh, want to call your attention to some books that he published um, over there. With, that's only a few of his books. That's the ones that we happen to round up. But um, he's published extensively, done a lot in terms of Bay Area publications in history, and a lot with regard to Japanese American history. So with that, I am very pleased to present Charles Wollen. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Notice the, the the prime word in her introduction was past, past this, past that. When you get old, you you have a lot of past uh, honors, honors. Anyway, um, uh, the obviously the the um, removal and incarceration of people of Japanese descent during World War II has, has been a subject that historians, and particularly California historians, have have devoted a lot of attention to, and rightfully so. And as you might expect, and quite properly, the focus of that attention has, has been on the people, on the victims of that process, the people whose rights were deprived of the material and emotional cost of the process. But one of the parts of the story that hasn't been told as much is the, um, the role of at least some members of the broader community, the white community, who actually stood up and opposed the policies of removal and incarceration. And so, a couple years ago, I did a very extensive and very long, probably too long, article on a group called the Fair Play Committee that was organized in Berkeley just before World War II. It actually had several different formal names. As, as, during its four years, I think it changed its name four different times. But the, the term Fair Play Committee was always in the name, and that was how it was normally recognized uh, by its members, by its opponents, by the media. So I'm just going to use that term, Fair Play Committee. Um, I, I want to emphasize that talking about the Fair Play Committee does not in any way um, devalue the, the resistance, the coping that the people who were actually directly affected by the incarceration uh, did and the tremendous efforts they made after the war to get compensation. But I think that the, the role that these white liberals, if you want to call it that, play is also significant and at least it, uh, something that needs to be covered. Um, I started this very long article that I'm not going to be able to cover in much detail in 45 minutes, but I started it with a, um, with a quote from a man named Alfred Lundberg, and he wrote a letter to his good friend and longtime associate, Governor Earl Warren, and he said, I am convinced we must deal fairly with the loyal Americans of Japanese ancestries 
who have been evacuated from our state. Now, Al Lundberg was the sort of epitome of the establishment in the Bay Area in California. He was the CEO of the Key System, the big private um, private corporation that ran the uh, bus and train and ferry system in the East Bay in the 1940s. He was a former president of the California Chamber of Commerce. He served on various nonprofit uh, boards. Uh, he lived in a big house in Piedmont. So he, he's a kind of symbol almost of, of the California establishment. And of course, Earl Warren was also very much a member of that same establishment. By 1943, he had just been elected governor. Before that, he had served a term as, uh, as district, as attorney general, rather, of California, and then several terms as district attorney of Alameda County. Like um, Lundberg, he was a Republican, he was a Mason, all the kind of uh, things that establishment type people in that era would, would be part of. And yet, in spite of all their common ties and longtime friendship, they fundamentally disagreed about the issues of the removal and incarceration of people of Japanese descent. Um, Lundberg was one of the original organizers of the Fair Play Committee. Earl Warren, I think you'd have to say, was the titular leader, the de facto leader of the forces in favor of the um, in favor of the removal and in favor of the incarceration. Um, and so, I guess the, the, the title I think I, I gave of this thing was Establishment Rebels. Those, many of the people, most of the people in that Fair Play Committee were members of the establishment of California, yet they were rebelling against the rest of the California establishment and indeed much of the political system of the country. The Fair Play Committee was uh, organized in Berkeley in September of 1941 by David Prescott Barrows, who was a former UC president and uh, by 1941 a political science professor at uh, Cal, and Dr. Galen Fisher, who was a um, faculty member at the Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley and also a visiting scholar, or a, I guess not a visiting scholar, but a scholar at the University of California as well. And they organized this as a way of responding to the rapid rise of anti-Japanese feeling in California, and not just anti-Japanese feeling um, directed at the Japanese government, but also at people of Japanese descent. Obviously, racism and anti-Japanese feeling had a long heritage in California, but it was escalating dramatically in, the, in that period of the summer and fall of 1941. And their idea was to have a, a committee of uh, prominent people who would defend the loyalty of the people of Japanese descent living in California and the United States, and also make that separation between the people of Japanese descent, the majority of whom were, of course, American citizens, and the Japanese government and the Japanese nation. Um, membership included prominent business people like Al Lundberg, it, uh, Protestant ministers, community leaders, um, and obviously, given the Berkeley background, a lot of academics, the president of Mills College, the president of Stanford, the president of the Pacific School of Religion, and many um, prominent Cal faculty members, people like uh, economics professor um, Paul Taylor and his wife, the famous documentary photographer, uh, Dorothea Lang, for example. Probably the most prominent member, or clearly the most prominent member of the committee was Robert Gordon Sproul, the president of the University of California. Um, Sproul, again, had a long connection with Earl Warren. In fact, they had, they had been undergraduates together at Cal in the early 20th century. Uh, Sproul, in addition to being the Cal professor, was a very important figure in California life at that time, and a particularly powerful figure in the Republican Party. And of course, Earl Warren was a Republican governor. The, the two men were close enough that when Earl Warren ran for president after the war in 1948, he actually had Robert Gordon Sproul give the nomination speech at the Republican convention. And yet, in spite of all those ties, Sproul and Warren fundamentally disagreed on the issue of the removal and incarceration of people of Japanese descent. Um, 
Well, you know, the, the, the committee was formed in September of 1941, uh, just as it was getting started. The attack on Pearl Harbor occurred, and within a couple of months, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066. And to say that the Fair Pay Committee was a voice in the wilderness in opposing the, uh, the incarceration is, is putting it mildly. I mean, they were shouting down. It's just, it's just impossible to, to perceive the amount of popular and political support that the incarceration policy generated. And not only popular groups, but, you know, things like um, the California Federation of Labor, the, the Farm, California Farm Bureau Federation, the native sons and daughters of the American West, um, the media, uh, particularly the Hearst and McClatchy newspapers, the Los Angeles Times in particular. Um, the support for the incarceration went from the right, from groups like the Associated Farmers, a very right-wing conservative group, all the way to the Communist Party, which also supported the, the policies of incarceration. So, not surprisingly, the Fair Play Committee was, was literally shouted down and their voice was practically not heard. But during 1942, they did accomplish a couple of things. Um, as you know, the, the, the camps were set up in such a way that there was education for elementary and secondary kids, but there was no provision for elementary educa for education rather for college students. And so it was uh, actually Paul Taylor, the Professor Paul Taylor tale, came up with the idea of allowing college students to leave the camps and to enroll in colleges outside of the restricted zone in, in the Midwest and the East. And after a lot of argument and a lot of hesitation from the federal government, particularly after Robert Gordon Sproul supported that proposal, the feds allowed it to happen. And as you probably know, about 4,000, um, you say, students were took advantage of that program during the war. It initially was um, run out of Berkeley but eventually it became administered by the American Friends Service Committee out of, out of Philadelphia. The other accomplishment, if you want to call it that, that the Fair Play Committee achieved in 1942 was to find a, um, an ally in the, most, uh, in the most unexpected place, I guess. Uh, President Roosevelt used the Army to round up people. Once people got into the camps, um, the camps were actually administered by a civilian agency, I'm sure you all know, called the War, the, the War Relocation <coughs> Authority. And even though it was within the Department of War, what we now call the Defense Department, um, the WRA was a civilian agency run by a civilian director. And by well, the summer or fall of 1942, that director, Dylan Myers, like his predecessor, um, uh, what's his name, Eisenhower, Milton, Milton Eisenhower, thank you, Milton Eisenhower, both of them, Eisenhower had only served for the director for three or four months, but Myers also had come to the conclusion that the policy of removal and incarceration was unnecessary, unwise, and probably unconstitutional. He was a, um, New Deal bureaucrat. Um, he believed that the solution to America's quote unquote racial problems was assimilation. That is, people from minority groups should assimilate into the mainstream, into middle class American uh, values. And of course, from his point of view, the camps were exactly the opposite. You were separating people. Um, he was politically aware enough to realize that the chance of closing down the camps in 1942 and 1943 was slim to none. But he began kind of building on the student program. He began advocating the idea of allowing people to leave the camps and settle voluntarily in places in the Midwest and the East. And um, Meyer's point of view pretty much um, reflected the point of view of many of the people in the Fair Play Committee. They also felt that the uh, incarceration was unnecessary, wise, unconstitutional. Many of them also bought into the kind of assimilation ideology that, that Myers and men, uh, advocated. And most of them politically very 
connected people realized that the best you could hope for was Meyer's policy of allowing people to voluntarily leave the camps. The idea that the camps would be phased out in 1942 or 1943 was unlikely. So by the end of 1942, you had this, this kind of very strange, you know, people talk about politics, strange about fellows and all that. You had this strange alliance of the group that was perhaps the most vocal in opposition to the um, camp program align itself with the leader of the government administration that was actually running the camps. Um, by the end of 1942, the, um, early 1943, the Fair Play Committee had generated enough money through membership dues and through some foundation grants. They were, able, they were able to actually establish some very modest, a very modest office in Berkeley and also one in San Francisco. And they were able to hire, very low pay, a, an executive secretary, a woman named Ruth Kingman. Um, she, was, her husband was Harry Kingman, who was the director of Styles Hall at the University of California, YMCA. Um, Harry Kingman had been a major league baseball player. He played for the, for the Yankees. And when he retired, the Kingmans, Harry and Ruth, went to work for the YMCA in Asia. They lived for a time in China and in Japan. When they came back to the United States, uh, Harry was um, hired as the freshman baseball coach at Cal and as the director of Styles Hall. And the Kingmans, they were, they were liberal Protestants. Both of them were, were children of Protestant ministers. And they kind of engrossed themselves in the um, community not only the university, but at Berkeley. They became very involved in efforts, for example, to fight racial discrimination and segregation, which was common in Berkeley and virtually every California, or bad matter, every American town during that period. Um, style, they, they, they ran Styles Hall as perhaps one of the few, if not the only place in Berkeley, where students of different ethnicities could actually get together and, and have social and intellectual activities and, and a kind of equal status. And many um, Japanese American students became members of Styles Hall, became active, and became close, established close friendships with the, with the Kingmans. When Executive Order 9066 was issued, um, Ruth Kingman and a few of her friends put a lot of pressure on the um, Congregational Church in Berkeley, the Dana Street, to open up its um, community hall to be the point of embarkation for people in Berkeley who were being relocated. And they served coffee, cake, cookies, they gave um, toys to the children. Every family was given a letter from the Congregational Church saying that uh, you are still our neighbors and we'll welcome you back when you come back. Uh, when, the, when people were sent to the temporary camp at Panforan, Ruth Kingman and some of her friends would visit the camp almost every day, bringing household goods, just providing contact with the people, with the outside world. And when the people moved to uh, the so-called permanent camp in Coppola, Utah, in the holiday season of 1942, Ruth Kingman went out to Topaz, stayed there for about three weeks, and organized a Christmas pageant. She was a uh, She'd been a music major at the College of Pacific and organized these kind of pageants it was one of the things she did. So, not surprisingly, Ruth and Harry Kingman were sort of card-carrying members of the Fair Play Committee. And it's not surprising that when the committee was looking for an executive secretary, they picked, uh, they picked Ruth Kingman. At about the same time that she became executive secretary, Harry became the West Coast director of the Federal Fair Employment Practices Commission, an agency established by President Roosevelt to enforce the non-discrimination clauses in the defense contracts. And not too long after she became executive president, Ruth used Harry's political connections and the political connections of a lot of these prominent Fair Play Committee members to make the first of two very important lobbying trips to Washington, D.C. She had a meeting with um, John J. McCloy, 
the assistant secretary of war and the man who was really to whom the, the war relocation authority would um, answer to. And they had a, she, I think she called it a polite but not very cordial meeting. She had a much more cordial meeting with, um, with Francis Biddle, who was the Attorney General of the United States, and who from the beginning had opposed the um, incarceration program. He had objected to it on uh, constitutional grounds, had argued against it in cabinet meetings, and he was more than willing to talk to Ruth and to talk about strategies to, to overcome the, the, the program. She also had access to the leadership of the FBI. You know, J. Edgar Hoover is usually not perceived as a great defender of civil liberties, but actually uh, he and the FBI opposed the incarceration. His, his argument was that we have thoroughly infiltrated all the Japanese and Japanese American organizations and we know there is no disloyalty there. I've often suspected that he also was probably angry at the fact that if you're going to have this kind of program with the FBI, wasn't well, right. <laughs> Somebody else. But anyway, she was able to establish you know, work, a working relationship with the FBI leadership. She, made, she had contact with some uh, sympathetic members of Congress, and she established a very important ally in the White House. The President's daughter, Anna Roosevelt Boddicker, was um, living in the White House because her husband was serving in the armed forces. And her mother, Eleanor Roosevelt, was often away, so that Anna was really the, the kind of official hostess. And she was the member of the Roosevelt family that was closest to the president, one of the only family members that you really, I think, uh, could deal, you know, had a very close relationship with. And, and actually, for the rest of the war, they had a, they had a uh, correspondence. And I think it's fair to say that she was a, a um, supporter of the Fair Play Committee. Um, for example, um, I guess it was in 1943, um, Ruth Kingman arranged for some of the pictures uh, painted by um, Kira Obata, the, the, the famous artist and Cadillac art professor, some of his pictures of the camp experience. She gave them as, she arranged for them to be given as gifts to the Roosevelt family. And apparently Anna made sure that those paintings were, were hung in the White House uh, living rooms. Um, in addition to her, well, and then uh, most of all, I think what Ruth Kingman did was to really deepen the alliance with Dylan Myers and the WRA, um, particularly during the three years that Ruth was executive secretary, that there was really no distance between Myers and the Fair Play Committee. In addition to traveling to Washington, she traveled up and down the Pacific Coast. She visited several of the camps. She even visited the um, Army base in Mississippi that the 442nd was training in. She had just innumerable meetings with federal, state, and local government leaders. She gave interviews to the newspapers. She distributed thousands and thousands of copies of flyers and position papers and essays. She um, I mean, she became the face and the voice of the Fair Play Committee. She was much more than just a, you know, a staff person. She became really the decision maker and, and the personification of that, of that Fair Play Committee. Um, and um, twice during the three years that she shared as executive president, she, she was required by her doctor to take a one month leave of absence because she became just completely exhausted. Uh, she, she just devoted her life to this, to this cause. And by, by uh, say, the spring or summer of 1943, it seemed like they were making some progress. By that time, the, the idea of allowing people to leave the camps voluntarily was beginning to be established, and at least a trickle of people were beginning to be able to leave the camps under that program. Eventually, the American Friends Service Committee also um, pretty much administered that program. And even kind of symbolically, even more important, in the spring of 1943, the War Department um, um, 
replace General John DeWitt as the military commander of the 6th Army, that is the military and the army commander for the West Coast. General DeWitt, as I'm sure you know, was the most the most, uh, the most enthusiastic backer of the uh, of the incarceration program. He uh, defended it in the most um, blatantly racist uh, arguments. He was the man who, when somebody asked, "Is it is it necessary to incarcerate both Japanese citizens and American citizens?" His answer was, "A Jap is a Jap." One in the spring of 1943, he was replaced by General Delos C. Emmons. And General Emmons had been the Army commander in Hawaii at the time of the December 7th attack. General Emmons had uh, vehemently opposed the idea of rounding up significant numbers of people in Hawaii. He had gone way beyond. He had made a tremendous effort to emphasize that the people of Japanese descent in Hawaii were loyal to the United States. When the Secretary of the Navy claimed that there had been large-scale um, treason and cooperation, uh, General Emmons uh, refuted that. He used the Honolulu police chief and the FBI to, to show that, in fact, that wasn't the case. And so, replacing DeWitt with Emmons, making Emmons the military command of the San Francisco Presidio was um, seen particularly by well-connected people on the Fair Play Committee as a significant shift in, in government policy. And actually, Ruth Kingman established a very good working relationship with the Army commanders at the Presidio after Emmons came into power. Um, let's see how we do so much stuff. <laughs> You know, Ruth, Ruth Kingman and most and many of the members of the Fair Play Committee were also members of the American Civil Liberties Union. And at, in 1942, the ACLU national um, leadership decided that they would not challenge the policy of removal and, incar and incarceration. But the Northern California branch of the ACLU, um, headquartered here in San Francisco, led by uh, Ernest Besick, decided that they would, in fact, challenge it. And in direct defiance of the national policy, they took on the case of the Fred Karamazov. And in late 1943 and 1944, the local National California branch also um, took on the case of the of protesters at Tule Lake Camp um, that had been um, arrested and put into the stockade and had engaged in a um, hunger strike. And uh, Bessig gave them um, legal um, backing and eventually got them released from the stockade, though obviously not from the camps. Um, and Bessig urged Ruth um, Kingman to become a member of the executive committee of the Northern California branch of the ACLU. And she refused on the grounds that the Fair Play Committee should have a moderate, quote unquote, responsible image. Uh -huh. That it shouldn't be identified with this rebel group of people in the ACLU, and it shouldn't be identified with the protesters at, at Tule Lake. Uh, and, and it was partly for the public image, but I think it was also for this idea that she was she was part of the in group now. She was dealing with Policymakers in Washington and San Francisco, and so you you had to have this image that an elite power maker would have. Um, the Fair Play Committee actually even sided with um, with Dylan Myers with his idea to concentrate people that he defined as quote unquote troublemakers at the Tule Lake camp. And the argument that the Fair Play Committee made was, this will mean that the public can then be assured that all the other people at all the other camps were loyal and way they could safely be, be released from the camps. So, as is often the case when you're involved in power politics, there's a lot of compromises. Compromises, at least what, from my point of view, would be their, some of their basic principles. Um, 
The Fair Play Committee never had more than six or seven hundred members. And they tried initially to have a uh, system where they would have local chapters in various California communities, and even in Seattle and Portland. But the only local chapter that ever really got developed was one in Pasadena and all places. But they, they became very concerned about the fact that they had no significant operation in Los Angeles, which was after all the largest city in California, the largest city west of the Mississippi. And so in 1944, they made a concerted effort to recruit prominent people in Los Angeles. And the way they did it was to have Robert Gordon Sproul give a speech at a luncheon meeting at the California Club, a very exclusive club in downtown Los Angeles, where 60 or 70 very important people met. Sproul had become the um, honorary president of the Fair Play Committee, but he, you know, he was too busy to be involved in much of the day-to-day -day activities. But he agreed to make the speech, and it was apparently a real a really good speech. He not only defended uh, the Fair Play Committee, he defended people who had the sin, but he took out after what he called the forces of bigotry and racism, and not too subtle digs at the Los Angeles Times. And uh, the, the um, speech was a great success. More than 40 of the people at the meeting agreed to become part of the Fair Play Committee. It included prominent business people, professional people. It included the Catholic Archbishop, of Los Angeles, the leading, one of the leading rabbis in Los Angeles, and it included a lot of academics, including um, um, Robert um, Milliken, who was a Nobel Prize physicist at Caltech. Um, so the Fair Play Committee remained a prim primarily Bay Area group, but it did at least have that some presence in LA by 1944. By that time, um, things were again moving in the Fair Play Committee's right direction. In the spring of 1944, President Roosevelt announced that the War Relocation Authority would be moved from the Department of War under Secretary Stimson and Under Secretary um, McCloy, who had been strong supporters of the incarceration program. It was moved to the Department of Interior under Secretary of the Interior, Harold Dickies. And Dickies was one of those people, along with Attorney General Biddle, who from the very beginning had opposed the incarceration program. Um, Dickies had been one, was one of the longest serving members of the Roosevelt administration. He went all the way back to the early 30s. He was blunt, plain spoken, and he let everybody know what he believed. In cabinet meetings, when other cabinet members would talk about relocation centers, he would say, no, they're concentration camps. And he made everybody, including the president, very much aware of what he believed. And so from the point of view of people in the Fair Play Committee, when the president shifted the WRA and the administration of the camps over to the Interior Department under Ickes, that meant a significant shift in administration policy. And in April of 1944, Ickes came out to the West Coast. He met with leaders of the Fair Play Committee, and he made it very clear that his aim was to end the camp program. His, his um, strategy was to have secret negotiations with the Department of War and the military to get them to end the special security zone that had existed on the West Coast. And once they ended that zone, there would be no more legal or security reason to keep people in the camps. And um, even though these were secret negotiations going on in Washington, uh, Ruth Kingman and other members of the committee were aware of it, kept aware of what was going on. And they knew that by the summer, or at the end of the summer of 1944, um, Hickey's had succeeded. That is, the Department of War, Secretary Stimson was willing to say that the, the uh, zone was no longer necessary. But when Ickes went to the White House, they said the timing is not correct because the president is running for re-election in November and we don't want to do anything that will increase political opposition. So in effect, the civil rights and liberties of the people in the camps 
were delayed for partisan political reasons. Of course, that never happens now in America. <laughs> um, well, of course, Roosevelt was reelected, and, and by uh, by the end of November, particularly Dylan Myers, but also Secretary Hickey's, were pointing out that the Supreme Court was going to be ruling on the Korematsu case almost any day now and that the administration could be embarrassed tremendously if the court ordered the administration to close down the camps. And so what Ickes and Myers were arguing was, we should do it ahead of time. We should do it without being forced to do it. And eventually that argument um, succeeded. So that on December 17, 1944, the government announced that the special security zone on the West Coast was ended and that people could voluntarily leave the camps and return back to their homes on the West Coast. It was that announcement on December 17, 1944, that at least officially ended the removal and incarceration program, although the camps stayed open in many cases for several months after that. The next day, and clearly the White House had been, had been tipped off, the next day on December 18th, the court issued its decision on the Korematsu case. And as you probably know, the court in effect upheld the right of the president to remove, to involuntarily remove people from the security zone. But in a, um, in a uh, other case, the Endo case, the court said, but once you remove those people, you cannot keep them against their will in the camps unless you go through some sort of due process and show that there is some legitimate reason. Now, technically, those decisions were moot because the government had already, in a sense, said the camps are going to be closed down. But those two decisions remain on the books, remain precedent, because they've never been, they've never been overturned. Um, in January of 1945, the Fair Play Committee held a big conference, a two-day conference here in San Francisco at the Palace Hotel. And it included um, members of state, local, and federal social service agencies, uh, private charities, private nonprofits. And the purpose of the conference was to prepare for the return of thousands of people uh, to the West Coast. There were practical problems, you know, housing, employment, but um, there were also, um, there was the kind of 400 pound gorilla. And that was the possibility of violent, racist reaction as people came in. And um, partly because of that, um, the Fair Play Committee for the first time actually uh, divided or disagreed with Dylan Myers. The Fair Myers, with his assimilationist point of view, said, what we should do is we should close down the camps just as quickly as possible. If necessary, we should forcibly evict people out of the camps. And Ruth Kingman was saying, well, you know, let's not go that far. Let's wait until we're sure that we have housing, that we have jobs, that we have security for people. And, and she eventually went over Myers' head to Secretary Hickey's. And Secretary Hickey's, after a lot of argument back and forth, came down on Myers' side so that, as you probably know, all the camps except Tule Lake were closed before the end of 1945. And um, Tule Lake, I think, was closed in February or March of, of 1946. Um, by the end of December of 1945, the Fair Play Committee felt that their job was over. They, in effect, declared victory and um, ended their, their existence. Um, Ruth Kingman, Ruth and Harry Kingman went, came, went back to Berkeley and reestablished their their role as um, in the um, Stiles Hall. And when Harry retired in 1957, they moved to Washington and established a group called the um, the Citizens. I can't remember, but a, a, a grassroots group supporting liberal political issues, particularly federal civil rights laws, and. Um, in the 1970s, they went back to Berkeley. Uh, Harry died in the 1970s. Ruth lived on until, um, the until the early 90s when she was in her 90s. Um, and she died in 
and she eventually received an honor from the Japanese American Citizens League for her, for her efforts during World War II. As you probably know, Earl Warren went on to become Attorney General, or excuse me, to become uh, Chief Justice of the United States. And maybe we can talk in, if you want in the question and answer period about Warren's role in the post-war period and his defense of his actions during World War II. But anyway, uh, that's a very brief uh, history of the Fair Play Committee, and um, if you really want to get into all the details, read the, read the article. But you probably don't have to read the article. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And actually, I was going to hold the article up, but I had it over there at the table. Somebody must have been looking at it. The journal, the California. Oh, okay. So, the um, Charles Ollenberg's article is in here about the Fair Play Committee, the um, California history. And the picture that you see on your agenda um, is inside here. You can also you can also you can also get the article online. Online. Yeah. Very good. Okay. I read the article. <laughs> um, does anybody have a burning question? I was I was going to wait until the end, but I thought maybe just in case somebody really wants to ask a redirect to Charles Wallenberg before we move on, feel free to do that. Otherwise, you can wait until the end. But if you really want to ask some. Something right now that's okay. What, maybe one or two questions. No. Okay, Ben. Uh, when you made the reference to white liberals right at the beginning, right? Can you tell us something about the uh, political roots of that liberalism? Well, I think I, th I think the, the the I think the reference I made was particularly to Ruth and Harry Kingman, and it also would apply to. Um, Galen Fisher, one of the founders of the Fair Play Committee, they were, I think, they were from a strain of liberal Protestantism that I think maybe doesn't exist anymore, or does exist and people don't hear it anymore, but there was a strong strain of liberal Protestants who can combine their Protestantism with, um, I guess, liberal humanism, particularly with fighting against racism and segregation. And the Kingmans were really part of that tradition. Galen Fisher were really part of that tradition. The American Friends Service Committee, committee and its stand on the internment, I think, was part of that tradition. And so, and, and, and you know, eventually, much of the civil rights movement after World War II, including Martin Luther King, are part of that tradition. So I think it's, it's, it's kind of that liberal Protestantism. And it, that's part of the group that helps uh, organize and run the Fair Play Committee. The other part goes back to these more distinguished people like, like um, Lundberg and Robert Gordon Sproul. Um, I don't know if that... Okay, thank you. All right, so you've been sitting there for a little while. It'd be really good if you just stand momentarily and we'll just start on the second speaker, but just can you just stand up just briefly and kind of <laughs> wake yourself up just for a minute. It's always helpful to stretch a little bit.